flame of southern skies. I'm going to stake me out a claim in paradise. Because I'd like to see Samoa of Samoa. Polynesia has long been a place where the best parts of human nature might be realized. Since the 19th century, Americans had come to think of the South Pacific as paradise. And this image was reinforced by photographs, by books, by people like Robert Louis Stevenson. In all my dreams, I see the vision of the moonlit tropic shore and that maiden Polynesian. People generalized really from the beautiful environment of the South Seas and from the beautiful physical presence of Polynesians who were beautiful people to a kind of an image of the best that people could be. In August 1925, Margaret Mead arrived in Pongo Pongo on the Samoan island of Tutuila, only to find that her island paradise wasn't exactly what she'd been expecting. She arrived in Pango, went out to some of the other villages to scout around, but she was struck by the degree of westernization of Pango Pango. American Samoa was a colonial backwater. The American naval government ran American Samoa, and the main island of Tutuila was fairly Americanized. Meade was looking for something a little less civilized. But if Pongo Pongo wasn't the ideal place to discover just how un-American Samoan adolescence was, it still required Meade to get to grips with a local tongue. Utunia, to be hated. Utumaona, to have an abundance of food. The first thing I had to do was to learn the language. Now, this was new. Uh, anthropologists were not required to learn the language in those days. They were required to learn about the language, to learn the grammar, to take down very careful texts, but not to use it in everyday life. For the next six weeks, Mead stuck doggedly to her task. My mother was determined to be able to do her work in Samoan, to get rid of the interpreter and deal directly. And she worked around the clock, really. Dear Dr. Boaz, I have now a vocabulary of about 500 words. I can express any type of idea except some so-called subjunctive expressions with very little difficulty. I have talked to 10-year-old children for 15 and 20 minutes and made myself understood. I am quite confident now that I will be able to handle the language well enough for the requirements of my problem. By now, Mead had decided to relocate. Armed with her 500 words of Samoan, she set sail for the remote island of Ta'u about a hundred miles from Pongo Pongo. But Mead soon discovered that remoteness had its drawbacks. The two biggest problems of field work, one is loneliness, the fact that you are totally away from home, and the other is what we refer to as culture shock. That shock was all the greater when Margaret Mead realized she faced the disturbing prospect of having to share a room with the natives. If I lived in a Samoan house with a Samoan family, I might conceivably get into a little more intimate touch with that particular family. But I feel that such advantages would be reaped would be more than offset by the loss of efficiency due to the food and the nerve-wracking conditions of living with half a dozen people in the same room. And so, unlike many anthropologists of the time, 
Mead decided not to live with the natives. Instead, she found lodgings in the home of an American naval family stationed on the island. She said, don't try to pretend to be one of the community. Don't insist on doing all the work that they do, uh, wearing the clothes that they wear. You're there as an observer. You can't conceal it. And anything that you can pay for uh, or do to make yourself more efficient and comfortable, do it. But there was little that Mead could do to prepare herself for the harsh tropical climate. She was small. She was 5'2", weighed 98 pounds. She was frail in some ways. She has to contend with heat, humidity, mosquitoes, and like all anthropologists at one time or another, she throws up her arms and says, I wish that I was back in New York collecting subway fares. <coughs> but Mead stuck it out and quickly established a daily routine. Even with the heat, humidity, mosquitoes, and the despair that occasionally sets in, she is just a whirlwind of energy. She starts work at dawn and works until late into the night. She spent large sections of every day typing up her notes. She would try and be present for ceremonials. She would arrange conversations with people she wanted to interview. She would walk through the village. She did say to me once that one of the reasons she loved being in the field was that you made your own schedule. Nobody there was going to tell you what to do. Little by little, Mead began to understand the ways of her Samoan hosts. So I learned how to be courteous how to ask questions courteously. I learned how to sit and stand and receive a gift and start a dance. I learned never to speak standing up erect uh, if someone else was seated and always to bend over very far over in front when you walked in front of someone of rank. <laughs> As Mead discovered more and more about the Samoan adolescents she'd been sent to study, it dawned on her that there was something rather unusual about the way they'd been brought up. Children never learn the meaning of a strong attachment to one person. And because early childhood does not provide them with violent feelings, there are no such feelings to be rediscovered during adolescence. Mead discovered in Samoa a version of the extended family where uh, children did not have to live within this emotional um, pressure cooker of the nuclear family, that uh, in this environment, there, there was less tension within parent-child relations, and generally, um, emotions was more diffuse. All of which differed vastly from life back home. Mead felt that Samoan teenagers lacked some of the aggression that she saw in American life, that they lacked some of the sullenness that American teenagers had, the rebelliousness that they had. If American adolescence was full of storm and stress, then what she discovered was Samoan adolescence, by contrast, was quite different from the patterns that we imagined were universal. 